Rachel Mason, you co-wrote and directed Circus of Books on Netflix about your parents' ownership of the infamous gay bookstore in West Hollywood. Uh, it's discussed in the documentary that you and your siblings didn't really know much about the store your parents operated. When did you find out what the store actually was for and how old were you when you first stepped foot inside of it? Well, I mean, I was probably like three or four when I first stepped foot in there, but I didn't realize what I was in. And, you know, my entire uh, focus when I was actually a child was the candy. So it's kind of a funny thing to me when um, you hear people on the right saying things about how porn corrupts the youth, but I was literally in a porn store and couldn't care less about the porn because there was a giant sign that said over 18, which now when you think back on, uh, you know, how quaint that was when kids can literally open up a cell phone and be in immersed in porn instantly, um, you know, you would have had to actually get reprimanded by your parents physically, which happened if we walked through that over 18 section. Um, and I actually really did assume that every store just had an over 18 section for a long time. I, I really thought that that was, you know, stores must have over 18 sections. <laughs> Who knew? Um, but, you know, my mom really uh, never let us go in there. And then I, one or, once or twice we uh, ran in and I just remember the, the joy of running in was having my mom chase after us. And, and I do recall sort of like flashing past magazines with naked people on the covers, but it, it wasn't super exciting or interesting um, because I was a kid. And then uh, in high school, so that's when I realized what was really going on and how radical it was. And it was mostly because I was a rebellious high school kid and all my friends were the rebel rebels and queer. And I immediately immersed myself in everything queer and John Waters and campiness and things that were, you know, truly the culture of the store. And, you know, realized that my friends were making like a Mecca from the Valley to Hollywood. And, and, you know, I guess that's sort of, for those who might know, it's kind of like, you know, the New Jersey to New York kind of connection that there's the Valley, which is the part of LA that's sort of considered the suburbs kind of outside of the beating heart of culture. And I actually lived in Hollywood, but I went to school in the Valley because my public schools at the time would have been Hollywood and Fairfax high. And they were not at a high standard that my mom, who is a hardcore academic person, wanted me to get the best possible education. So the Valley had better schools. So I spent an hour on the bus each day going to the Valley. And that's where I met all my Valley kid friends who were obsessed with Circus of Books. And um, that's when I realized, you know, Fernando in the movie, who eventually says, Rachel, your parents ran a porn store. <laughs> he literally said those words to me when I was 15 and it didn't equate because my parents were boring. They were not cool. And my friends had really cool parents. You know, this is Hollywood. And I had friends whose parents were totally in the business. They were doing all kinds of interesting things. And, and my parents were dealing with payroll and invoices and totally boring, tedious aspects of running a business. So uh, what's so amazing about the documentary is it is so family centered, not just on your parents, Karen and Barry, but also on your brothers, Micah and Josh. And what was the reaction that they had when they saw the finished film? Well, I think everyone in the family was really nervous because we actually are a very private family, even, even the employees that, you know, in some ways I look at the story of the film as a, the, a family story that encompasses two families, that my parents were basically like parents to the store family, to all these employees that they really treated as their own children in, in many ways. I mean, my mom, uh, one day I was filming and she said, you cannot film today because Paula, one of our employees, is graduating college and I've been so waiting for this day for years and she's finally gonna be there. And I remember thinking, well, are her parents coming? And my mom was like, no, she doesn't have the kind of parents that would show up for a college graduation. I'm going to show up because I'm really proud of her. And, you know, my mom and dad both had these kind of almost like mentory relationships. And of course they also had relationships that were devastating when their employees were literally dying and they went to their 
bedsides. I mean, they were there at the very end when these people's families were not there. So on the one hand, my parents were this sort of like uber parents to the gay community and trans community. And at that time, it was just one giant community of the outcasts of gender and sexuality who were in the store. But they also were incredibly managing this double life, at least my mom, which was this kind of um, shielding her biological family from the world of the pressure cooker surrounding the store, which in an amazing way to me was like, what was a profound thing that, that gave, that gave my mom this extra depth, even though I've always been fighting her. She's always difficult. She's not easy. She's pretty much uh, the biggest critic one could ever have. So there's this sort of like intense, obnoxious Karen, very Karen, Karen Mason, um, you know, aspect to my mom that, uh, you know, was never not uh, a lot for me to deal with. And yet, on the other hand, I had to recognize that she really um, lived under a wall of secrecy and shame that in some ways was her own making because she chose such a kind of orthodox, you know, avenue within the religion. She could have chosen a more easy route within her religiousness, but she chose to be very traditional and conservative within her traditional worldview and actually embraced the harder lined ideological stance that was not open to homosexuality or, you know, anything LGBT in the religion. You know, that actually, uh, actually goes into the question that I was, that I wanted to ask next. Um, so, uh, cause, uh, it's outlined in the, in the movie, how, uh, your mother is, uh, a conservative, is a conservative, is part of conservative Judaism. Uh, it's discussed in great detail, especially, uh, in the wake of Josh's coming out, and she mentions that she wasn't able to, that she couldn't bring herself to leave the religion, but uh, did she ever, uh, and you, I guess you kind of touched on this, but did she ever consider joining uh, a more liberal branch of Judaism, like reform or uh, some other uh, more open, uh, more welcoming uh, synagogue congregation? You know, she has, and she did for a while join the LGBT synagogue of LA. There's, there's a two, and she joined this one called Kol Ami. And, you know, it actually really, for a moment, was the place that she could, you know, really be with other gays. Uh, but it really wasn't the, the level that she was used to in terms of the kind of uh, you know, it's almost like just real tradition, the traditions that she loved, which were all in Hebrew, you know, very heavy handed Hebraic, I guess you could say, um, texts, you know, the, the reform movement, which I love, I'm into it. It's my, <laughs> that's, that's my church is the reform synagogue, because it actually, to me, feels what, like, what makes sense and is relevant. But my mom just genuinely has the kind of like hard edge of davening and this is davening is the Jewish word for prayer, but like in this way that is, it's really old school. She's, she's, she's of that. And it, it's something that I think for me, one of the most profound things I was trying to illustrate in the film that my mom says, you know, when you have God in your life, it's just so this thing that is like, I mean, I guess in a way when, my, when people try to understand ideologies and they try to understand what, what might seem to a lot of people like this brainwashing indoctrination of some kind, which to me, I've always been very opposed to. And, you know, maybe it's just burned into me to be rebellious, but my mom has it in her to be traditional and to really, um, she just basks in it. It's comfortable and it's safe for her. And, and that's the piece of it that I think the conservative bordering on orthodox movement does you know it forces people to have a lot of rules that they follow and there's a kind of order that my mom really loves uh so one of the uh interesting connections uh in the movie that i found was uh the connection to larry flint uh because uh he uh your mother started as a reporter in cincinnati and that was where larry flint first really made uh a name for himself with his clubs and and, and later his magazines um, uh, when, uh, one thing that I don't know if this was covered in the documentary, but when, uh, Karen and, uh, Barry reached out to Larry Flint, when, 
by the time that they were out in Los Angeles. Did he remember the, uh, her from her days as a reporter back in Cincinnati? You know, it's so interesting that you say that. I don't really think so because it was never my mom. That, that's a great question. And it's really kind of an interesting thing to think of. But uh, when, I, when I talked to him recently, I just was blown away that, that he with this, you know, he has a multi in international, what is it, multi-billion dollar enterprise? I don't know, but he has casinos, he has so many things. And, um, you know, I was sitting there in his office, which is like this gilded ornate kind of Versailles in Hollywood. And, um, you know, I thought, wow, here he is, Larry Flint, kind of miraculous that he's even alive. And I, as soon as I said the name, you know, do you remember my parents? Um, and he said, wow, yeah, Barry Mason. And he knew my dad. And he said, Barry, you know, your dad and mom. But he, he just really remembered because my dad was the one who I think had the name on the um, enterprise, Barry Mason Enterprises, that it was just his ability to distribute so well because my parents were very hard working i mean they were going to be those people that distributed the crap out of his magazines because they they're total workaholics and so he just said your parents did very 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 well for us they were basically our best early distributors and i just thought wow you know you've been at this for like 35 years and you remember the you know this one little local magazine carrier and you remember this one store and it, it, it gave me a sense that what they did was actually bigger than I could imagine, really, because my parents always downplayed their role and they downplayed everything in terms of their connection to him. But the fact that Larry Flint remembered them, you know, it was really an amazing thing. And I do think it, it goes to show you that maverick group of people that were operating in the 70s that were, you know, people in the porn industry at that time you had to be a little out on a limb or a lot. I mean, you know, it's a really, it was illegal. It was not legal in most states. And you had to be really willing also to um, fly in the face of the judgment that you were going to receive by society. So I think that was what I came to understand and appreciate. And it, it also gave me a sense to living in LA, you know, Los Angeles is a city that I think is easy to, um, not appreciate in some ways just sort of like at the center of our culture but at the same time there's the the people who built the city on many different sides there's all the laborers within the city that keep these engines going but then there's also these really maverick people and i think the adult industry is like the most maverick of the people in entertainment but you know even just the regular people in hollywood um you have to be pretty risky to move to this town to be saying, okay, I'm going to be a filmmaker. I mean, that's, that was an insane profession. And, um, you know, the people that kind of created Hollywood, I started to recognize just making this film were amazing people and including, you know, Ryan Murphy who came on at the end to be an executive producer, you know, in some ways when it finally happened, I was so deep into making this film. I was just, you get to be like at your wits end when you make a film where you're kind of like, you can't see the forest for the trees. And um, I have one of the most amazing sales agents, Josh Braun, who said to me, Rachel, we're having a meeting with Ryan Murphy, like get it together. <laughs> you know? And I thought, Oh, Hey, but I, I, Josh, I have two minutes or two weeks till Tribeca. Like I, I'm really stressed out, but I guess I'll meet Ryan Murphy. Cause I know he's like God right now. So, or he is God. And then I met him and I just, you know, he put it, his name on this film and he told me how much he loved the film and how much the store meant to him. And, you know, I think I took it for granted because I just was in the zone of like finishing the film. And then when the film came out and I saw just the press and the connections in the media to Ryan Murphy, and I suddenly had this revelation that was like, wow, Rachel, like, like sit up and smell the coffee. There were no Ryan Murphys in Hollywood you know, until recently, an out gay man who's gonna champion a gay porn centered family film. I mean, this is so crazy. And that you, I had to suddenly have this whole, I mean, I already had respect for Ryan just as a, a craftsman and somebody who's brilliant at what he does, but for what he represents as a, a, a singular powerhouse of a gay man in this 
moment. It's sort of like Pete Buttigieg running for president. You're like, wow, okay, this is a milestone for the gay community that we now have a person like this being at this level, championing a film like Circus of Books and A Secret Love and other films that he has brought to the forefront. And, you know, I think that's something in the wider um, conversation that just has to be said, you know, Circus of Books, the success of it on the platform on Netflix and, you know, in the world in some ways connects to Ryan's advocacy of the film. So um, uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this that uh, you're now, uh, that the film is now an Emmy nominated documentary. Uh, you got nominated along with your co-writer um, mm -hmm. uh, for outstanding writing for a nonfiction program. Uh, what was it like to find out that you'd gotten an Emmy nomination for this project <laughs> that you'd sunk so much time and effort into? You know, the morning that I found out it was kind of funny because um, I had a pile of meetings and they were all really interesting and wild. And it was like one after another, after another, after another. And it was like 3 p.m. And I think when I first found out, I had just gotten a call from my grandma um, earlier in the day. And I just called her right back. And I said, Grandma, I just got this amazing news. I got nominated for an Emmy. Now I have to go by. And she goes, oh, that's great, honey. You know, and then I, I run outside and I see Buck is standing there. I go, Buck, I, I got nominated for an Emmy. And, and that his reaction was awesome. You know, he gave me a big hug and he was like, oh my God, I knew it. But he said, I knew it. He's always been like, I knew it. You're going to get nominated for an Oscar and an Emmy. And I'm always like, come on, there's no way. Because I started this film being that little person who was making a gay porn movie about Circus of Books and like, who really cares? And I actually had many, I mean, now it sounds maybe silly to say it, but I, you can't believe how many people I just said to me, good luck with that. <laughs> really good luck with that idea, Rachel. Uh, you know, call us when you're on your, to your next project or, you know, even at Tribeca. And I don't mean to throw the festival over, you know, under the bus at all, but this film was not in competition. This was not a film that was going to be, you know, hitting the, you know, competition slot. It was a viewpoints film, which was in a little tiny section with other films that were LGBT and, you know, student films. And, you know, I was demoralized by it, but I had been used to getting demoralized by this film because it was like, all right, I am, I am making a hard, difficult choice to make a film about gay porn at this moment and you know it's was not easy but because of what happened actually at Tribeca I do have to say that it's been exceeding my wildest expectations pretty much and maybe everyone else's too which is kind of to me really awesome because I'll say one thing being married basically I'm, I'm in a partnership with Buck Angel and he is you know central to the to the sex industry. He's a really big part of advocacy for um, sex workers. He's just, you know, very much pro uh, people who work in porn as he has. And, and you cannot believe the level of stigma that, you know, even in applying for COVID relief, I don't know if you noticed it, if you applied, but there is an actual sentence, maybe Mike Pence, you know, good for him, wrote it on there, but it says, if you work in the sex industry in any capacity, you cannot apply for this relief. And you know, seriously, wow, these are tax paying individuals. I mean, really, we are taxpayers. My parents have paid taxes for the entire duration of their careers. Buck pays taxes. Sex workers pay, ta pay taxes. Are you serious? You cannot get COVID relief? I mean, it was actually that relevant. I mean, there was no other industry that was singled out. So in some ways, I feel like vindicated <laughs> on the part of all the people that work in this industry. You know, it's a really, it's a re really beaten down um, attacked, kind of relentlessly attacked industry. There's like nobody easier to attack than people that work in porn and um, in sex work. So if there's anything I do feel the proudest about, you know, I feel extremely proud that it's, a, that it's an LGBT film and that it details a narrative that needs to be told in the community. 
but I think it could be the first time, and you know, maybe you can fact check this, but I would love to know if it's the first time a movie that has centered around sex work has achieved this level of getting to an Emmy and even being in consideration for an Oscar. And to me, that's what I'm the most proud of because you know, my parents really lived under the shadow of um, discrimination, which is still very much present, alive and present. Well, uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. I can't thank you enough for this. We wish you all the best this Emmy season. And to all our viewers, please uh, like this video, subscribe to this channel to get all our latest content. And don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thank you.